Sing the symphony My heart beats when it could not sing a P One G, play some keys to sing for me I get hooked to the chorus guaranteed uh, I'm a tempo tempo Music takes you to the place it came from Instrumentals in your mental echoes In your subconscious it hits and set those Catch Amazing Minds Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 20 hours Central African time on YouTube, Google, Apple, and Spotify for podcasters. Zambia's first late night show. You're welcome to Bible Talks. Fridays are for Bible Talks. If you're not subscribed, please do subscribe, hit that bell, and share. You can be a part of this great gospel by sharing this uh, broadcast today. I'm so excited to be here with you to share the Word of God with you. It's always a blessing, a privilege to come here every Friday and share uh, in the Word of God with you, share the scriptures with you. We have begun an amazing series that trust me is beneficial to your spiritual walk for some of you you may be hearing some of what i'll be talking about for the first time and some of you may have heard it before this is why you need to share that those who have never heard uh, this message may be able to hear it as well because it's important to understand that being born again is the start of the journey the journey does not end there after being born again, you need to grow. The Bible in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says, As newborn babies desire the spiritual milk of the word, the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Therefore, it's important that you share in order for those who are still spiritual babies to be able to be exposed to this. And if you have not learned what I'm going to be explaining before, then I would encourage you to pay close attention. Uh, get yourself to a place where you can have my full, or rather I can have your full attention. Once again, please do subscribe, hit that bell and share. Bible Talks comes every Friday, 20 hours Central African time. And we are discussing the personality of God. So today we're doing part two of, of this subject that we, we began. Uh, the other week we did part one, and in part one we discussed God being the source. And we talked about how God has dimensions within himself. So God is the source of everything. All the things that we can see and those things that we can't see came from God. We looked at the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and how it talks about the word of God being the one that framed the worlds. By faith we know that the word by faith, we know that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And this scripture describes to us the function of God's word in the process of creation. 
how that the word of God is the one that actually gives frame to whatever God is creating. So we being spirits are framed within a body. We take up the shape of the container and we become living souls. What begins in God's mind later goes into his word, is transported into his word, and then comes out as something we can see through God's actions. So you and I being existent today in this physical body where we can talk, touch each other, we can interact with our environment. We once existed in a different form within God because what distinguishes God's mind from ours is the reality of the world of his mind. Within God, everything exists. Everything that has ever existed exists within God. We can never go back in history to a time when there was nothing. There was always something. As a matter of fact, everything that is there today was always there. It only simply existed in a different form within God because whatever God creates begins in his thoughts. He determines what he will create, then he speaks it. And because he speaks it, it comes into being because the word of God becomes a transport system that is able to convert. We know that the word of God has the ability to become the word became flesh. So the word within itself has the ability to convert from God's spirit mind into a physical world or into spirit worlds. Jesus said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4 that God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. To properly understand this, you would need to distinguish the world of spirits from the world of flesh. And the, the same book of Hebrews chapter 11 further tells us that we know that the word of God framed the worlds so that the things that are seen were not made by things which are visible. So we know that to us, the world of flesh is visible and the world of spirits is not visible. Secondly, the world of flesh is meant for the earth. That's why we have the force of gravity that keeps us here. Even after men die, the body remains here in the earth. After men die, the bodies are trapped in the earth. And if you take a Bible study, you understand that after God made Adam, uh, gave him dominion, or he gave him the dominion before making him. But after God gave Adam the dominion and Adam passed on the dominion to his wife by blaming her after they ate the fruit and his wife did not keep the dominion, but she passed on the dominion to Satan by blaming the serpent. So Satan got the dominion and because of that was able to trap everyone in the earth when they died. So the earth became a prison because Satan had taken over it and every person that died was trapped under. That's why when you read the book of Luke chapter 16, we're told of Abraham being beneath the earth. Abraham, a righteous man who believed in God, was still in the earth. When Lazarus died, he went into Abraham's bosom and Abraham was able to converse with the rich man who was in hell because they were in the same location. And the only thing that distinguished them was a gulf that stood between the two. I don't know if it was glass or whatever material it was. It enabled them to see each other but not be able to cross over to where each other are. And so we know that the earth is meant for bodies and spirits are meant for the heavens and for hell. So the way we understand the earth to be a globe with countries and continents and cities and towns, we could take the same understanding and apply it to the heavens, that God's heaven is the ultimate heaven. And then we have countries, other heavens, other worlds, other cities, where there are different races of angels. Take, for example, we could have a world of seraphim and a world of cherubim, and we could have a world of the archangels, and we could have a world of the orphanim, and we could have a world of angels that look like men. I remember the book of Daniel where Daniel saw Gabriel and he says, the man, Gabriel, was made to fly swiftly. This is because angels are not governed by gravity. 
They are spirits. And some of them may even look like men, but they are not men. Some of them even have the ability to take up the form of a man, but they are not men. So we know that there are different kinds of angels, different angelic races. Think of it the way you have your Asian friend and your African, or you have your white friend and you are uh, from Australia. You have different, different, different races on the earth amongst human beings. And then amongst the beasts that exist on earth, we have cows, we have uh, dogs, we have cats, we have crocodiles, we have all manner of things. We have fish, we have birds. And the Bible says that the flesh of each of these is different. So understanding the world of spirits and distinguish it, distinguishing it from the world of flesh may give you a better understanding not only of God, because Jesus said God is this, God is a spirit and must be worshipped in spirit and in truth, but also the kingdom of God to understand that God's kingdom is not only for the earth, but it extends into many other worlds. And when you have this perspective, then it narrows you down into your purpose and assignment within God's kingdom. Why did God go on to create earth having already had other worlds existing? And I'm going to take you through a couple of scriptures. I know uh, for some of you, you may be wondering, where does the Bible say that there are worlds? And I know I read your scripture last week that said, by faith we know that the word of God framed the worlds. Right? And the word worlds used there is eon, which would mean a time period, a lengthy period of time. And eon is an age. So the Bible talks about this age or the age to come. Let me, let me give you this example. From Adam to Noah was an age. It's actually referred to as the antediluvian world because the world came to a conclusion at that time, but not completely because eight were saved, including animals. From Noah to Jesus could be considered a world, an age. So we could call these eons, we could call them worlds and after Jesus came the church age, which is what we are in now, which is a world. And we have a world afterward, which the Bible refers to as the age to come. I like how Jesus says, those that shall be counted worthy to obtain that world. Because when Jesus says this, he's not saying there'll be a new globe, a new stone, a new rock that God will form earth. But he's talking about a change in an eon, in an age, a system. God will bring it to an end like he has brought it to an end before. And make no mistake about this. Noah's flood was not the first flood. Neither was it the first time God was destroying the earth. So you need to understand the history of the earth and understand the scope of God's kingdom by understanding worlds that exist outside of earth. When you understand this, it narrows you into the purpose for why earth was made and why we are here today. Why were the inhabitants of earth before us destroyed? Judgment day came for them. We are preaching every day, judgment day, repent, repent. They had a judgment day and it came. They are not here today. So then, how do we understand why we're here? And how do we give proper account when our day of judgment comes? How are we going to be in a better position than the previous world? And I'm going to show you scriptures for these things. I know right now you might want to be clicking off because you're wondering, where is all this going? Where is all this going? You may be wondering. Let me read you a couple of scriptures. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God had made, in the, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Do you see that? These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. We understand that when God made Adam, 
every generation that would later exist was within Adam. We know this because when God made Eve after Adam, he did not go back to the dust of the ground to form Eve and breathe the breath of life into her body and Eve became a living soul. God went into Adam to bring out Eve. And God did not have to go back into Adam to bring out Cain and to bring out Abel. Neither did he have to go back to the ground. Also notice that when Cain and Abel were born, God did not have to come down and breathe the breath of life for them to become living souls. It's because before God made Adam, he had already given him dominion to the extent that when Adam finally came out into a realm that can be seen, and the spirit of Adam was placed into the body, out of the community of God, because God is a community of spirits. He's a cluster of spirits, a group of spirits. How do we know this? Look at the potency of Adam. When Adam was producing children, he's not just multiplying the body. He's multiplying his own spirit. His soul is being multiplied. I like how the Bible uh, says of Jacob that 12 souls came out of him. So you need to understand that the multiplication that's happening, the potency of Adam goes as far as multiplying spirits. So you mean all these spirits were in Adam? Yes, all these spirits before were in God. So God himself is the source of spirits. If you're studious and you've read the book of Enoch, for example, uh, Enoch refers to God as the Lord of spirits. He has populated the earth with spirits. So these are the generations of heavens, of the heavens and the earth. You need to understand what a generation is. When Adam gave birth to Cain and to Abel and the line went on to Noah, to Abraham, to, to Moses, all these people, these are generations, right? Generations are because genes are being passed down, customs are being passed down, laws are being passed down. You see, when my father was a younger man, he went through a lot of experiences. He went through some experiences he can't even tell me. Some he can tell me, some he can't tell me. And sometimes he'll sit me down and give me a lesson. Because he went through an experience that he can't share, but he can share the lesson. So he will tell me the lesson without explaining the experience. And if I'm wise, then I should learn from the lesson without having to go through the experience myself. A wise man once said experience is a, is a, is a, is a good teacher. But an even wiser man said the experience of another man is a better teacher because the lessons they're able to derive from their experience will narrow, shorten years. What my father learned through 10, 20, 30 years of experience, he can pass on to me as a lesson in a couple of sentences. So then I don't have to actually leave those 30 years to learn. Do you see what's happening? A generation is literally being passed on to another on the basis of what is being experienced. So many of us understand generations to be the passing on of genes. But I'm trying to alter your perception a little bit because to understand the generations of heaven, you have to understand that what is happening here on earth, the multiplication of generations, one generation to the other, is happening in the heavens. They are generations, except what they are passing on could be different. Maybe they are not passing on genes. Michael does not have children, probably. But what they are passing on is something. There is something that is being passed on that is able to make God call it a generation. What is being passed on from one senior to the other? So there are generations. And so the concept of generations that then spell, spelt into the earth when Adam came into the earth was something that already existed in the heavens, generations, and the earth also began to have generations. So there are generations in heaven, there are generations in the earth. We know to the extent that when an angel appeared to John in the book of Revelation, he said to him, I am of, do not kneel before me. I am one of your brethren who carry the testimony of Jesus. And then he explained what this testimony of Jesus is. Because did Jesus die for angels? 
No. So angels do not carry the testimony of Jesus. Why would this one then carry the testimony of Jesus? It's because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what you are trying to tell me is that there are angels that can prophesy. There are angels that are called prophets in the heavens. And they have brothers here on earth who have continued the generation of prophets. I know, I know. This may be a different from what you're used to, to listening to. But let me show you a couple, a couple more scriptures. So God is a spirit. Those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. To begin with, you must distinguish the word of spirits from the word of flesh. The word of flesh is for the earth. When people die, that's why their bodies don't go with them. They remain here because the word of flesh is for the earth. Flesh is here. And that rule is so strict to the extent that when men died, because Satan had dominion over the earth, he trapped them in the earth. Jesus needed to come back and get back that dominion, give it back to us in order to make a way, a passage into heaven because heaven is meant for spirits. Do you understand? This is why when Moses died, Satan had the audacity to claim his body because earthly things were his. Second Peter chapter three, verse three to seven. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that the word of but that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Just before I go further, let me explain this. In Genesis, when we begin to create uh, to to read the account of God's creation, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Yes, we understand, we accept that God did create the heavens and the earth. But verse two seems to tell us an incomplete story because it says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the waters of the deep and the spirit of God hovered upon the, upon the face of the water. Okay, seems something happened here between verse one and verse two because Peter here is now explaining to us that the heavens were actually of old and the earth was in the water and it stood up out of the water because God is now recreating. So God is not recreating from, from scratch the earth or the heavens because the heavens were already of old. The heavens had been existing, but something happened to them. And then the earth had been existing and something happened to it because the Bible is not explaining to us when God fastened the foundations of the earth and all this, the creation of the actual rock, the earth, is not being described in this book of Genesis. The scripture further goes on to say, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire, until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What? The heavens and the earth which are now are reserved for fire. Because the heavens that were of old and the earth that were of old, the earth that was before was destroyed by water. This is what Peter is saying. The earth that was before was destroyed by water and the heavens that are now and the earth that is now are reserved for fire. Now, some people might think Peter is referring to the time that God destroyed the earth during Noah's flood. But let me show you the scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 20. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Do you see that? As I explained to you, 
The earth is meant for flesh. Spirits are meant for the heavens. But rebellious spirits are meant for hell. Because there are prisons underneath the earth. So the Bible here is telling us of the time that God destroyed the earth during Noah's flood. But the earth was not completely destroyed because eight survived. Not only did eight survive, animals survived. So we know that the world that Peter was talking about when he said, because this is the same Peter, when Peter said the world which was destroyed by water, he's not talking about the time of Noah. Because at that time, the earth really was destroyed. We can see by Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 that the earth was without form and void. Something had happened. Something had happened for the earth to be destroyed, the heavens to be destroyed. And when God recreated them, he later destroyed the earth again, not completely during Noah's time, but then put a rainbow in order to prevent himself from destroying the earth with water again. This time, he has reserved not just the earth, but heavens for fire. Now, has God reserved his home for fire? No. This is now what must make you understand that when we talk about heavens, there are different heavens. There are even heavens where there are rebellious angels. Right now, angels that have rebelled against God are in the heavens. But the entire world, the entire heaven where those angels are, is reserved. How many, however many angels have rebelled, however many worlds host these angels, they have all been reserved for the day of judgment to be destroyed with fire. Now, if you want a clearer understanding, just to, to further understand that Genesis was actually not creation, let me show you what God said to Job, Job chapter 38 from verse 4 to 8. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb. So wait, the sea came from a womb and there are doors that shut it in. Wait, when earth was being created, the sons of God shouted for joy. It shows us that before God created the earth, there were already worlds existing where the sons of God were able to witness God create the earth. We're talking about the initial, initial creation of the earth where God actually fastened the foundations of the earth. He put lines upon it. I, I, I would like to believe that's maybe referring to some form of spiritual, spirit level that ensures that everything is symmetrical and in line. And, you know, God goes through this whole process of, of creating and the angels are watching and they're celebrating because God is forming something new. He's forming a physical world, a world of flesh, a world that is tangible and seeable. You can see this world. You can touch it. It's a tangible, physical world, unlike the world of angels. Unlike the world of angels. This world is actually tangible. You can actually... You can actually interact with its environment. You can actually interact with its environment. Now, in order for you to also further understand that there are heavens, more than one heaven, and there are heavens where there are rebellious spirits that dwell. Let me read you Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What? Spiritual hosts, 
hosts are armies. They are spiritual armies of wickedness in the heavenly places. Spiritual armies of wickedness in the heavenly places. No wonder God has reserved heavens for fire. Because there are heavens that are being inhabited by rebellious spirits as we speak. Just as the earth is being inhabited by rebellious flesh. And just as hell beneath the earth is being inhabited by imprisoned spirits. Some of whom Jesus delivered when he went to hell and preached. I don't know if all of them accepted him. Obviously not. There are different compartments in hell. But do you understand what I'm trying to say? Do you understand what I'm, what I'm explaining to you? That there are heavens, there are worlds outside of this world. And these worlds all together form up what we call the kingdom of God. God's kingdom stretches beyond heavens, beyond worlds. And now the earth takes a center stage because God has a special plan for earth. Unlike the angels and the heavens that are meant for spirits, God did not make angelic beings to be in his image according to his likeness. How do we know this? Because angels do not have dominion over the heavens. God has dominion over the heavens. The Bible says heaven is the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 actually goes as far as telling us that, let me read it to you. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So when God made man, one of the reasons why man then was considered to be in God's image and according to his likeness, according to his likeness is the type, this species resembles this species. This group of beings resemble this group of beings. This group of beings is like God. Why are we made according to his likeness and, his, and in his image? Because of this here. Because God gave us a world in which we have dominion. And this dominion is shown by our ability to be able to multiply, to populate this earth at will. We can decide to bring someone into the world. We have the ability to decide to populate the world. Just as God has populated his world, he is the Lord of spirits. He has filled the heavens with spirits. The billions and billions of God's host, the angels, yet none is like him. He created a physical world that took center stage because God decided to reflect himself in a physical world. He made beings that are like him, beings that have dominion over a world to the extent that God cannot do anything in this world without asking for their permission. It is not so with the angels. It is not so with the, it is not. That's why the angels know God differently from the way we know him. We tend to think we have opinions, we can talk back. No, the angels understand that God's word is final. It's because of who God has made us to be. He has actually made us like him. The Bible says that he is, so are we in this world. So God decides to make earth. Of course, this is the recreation of earth. The first inhabitants of the earth have long been destroyed. Their judgment day came. Uh, just as we have today, preachers telling us every day, repent, judgment day is coming. Repent, the rapture is coming. They probably had preachers telling them, repent, judgment day is coming. And maybe they didn't listen. And God destroyed the world with water. And when God destroyed the world with water, he decides to recreate it, but this time fills the earth with 
men. Because this time, God has a different plan. He wants to put a representative of himself in a physical world. Because one day, God wants to relocate from his heaven into a physical world. So in order to do this, God had to recreate the earth and put man in his image according to his likeness. Now man rebels and God brings another flood, destroys the earth, saves eight. And this time God says, mm -mm -mm -mm, I think I shouldn't do this again. He puts a rainbow in order to signify that he will not destroy the world again, not with water. No, when he destroys it this time, it will be with fire. And so will he do with the heavens where these rebellious hosts of wickedness are. I hope you're following. Now, because God has made earth, God then has to establish a plan that will allow for this successful transition, this successful move, of God from the heavens to the earth. This would involve a sacrifice. This would involve judgment. This would involve God establishing a kingdom which would eventually invite God's presence. There's a lot I, I have to share with you about, about God's strength, but I have to lay a foundation first for you to be able to understand angels, the worlds of angels, that they are different races of angels, the way you would think of your fellow brothers and sisters here on earth of different races. You can think of angels that way. They are different races of angels who live in different worlds. And some of them stand out. Ah, Michael, the archangel. Does that mean Michael is the only angel? Does it mean Michael is the only archangel? Does it mean when God created Michael, God created Michael like that? So you need to have a better understanding in order to then see where we are going. So God is the source. Everything came from God. And everything came out of God for a purpose. Now that God has created worlds, what then? God is strong. Take, for instance, you go for an arm wrestling contest. You are the champion in your village. Everyone knows you. They fear you. You actually break hands this side when you're doing arm wrestling. But this time you meet an opponent who has come with his friends, a thousand of them. In your mind, you're thinking, ah, no, my opponent is worthy but he has come with a thousand friends in order to give him a morale booster. You know, he needs to be encouraged. He needs his friends to cheer him on. He needs his friends to give him moral support. What you do not know is that these 1,000 friends that have come with your opponent have come as a resource. They don't need to sit in his chair in order to wrestle you. He can use their arms, their muscles, without you noticing. You will think it's him you are wrestling. But it's the collective power of the thousand that he has come with. You know why he's called the Lord of Hosts? The Lord of Sabaoth. The Lord of Angelic Armies. This is because God has done the work. He does not need to work anymore. God has created, been there, done that. He has reached the point where he doesn't need to stand from his throne. This is why God is self-sufficient. He has no reason. Think of the many reasons why you stand up from your chair. After I'm done with recording this, we will get up from all our chairs here and we'll go about with our lives. But God does not have need to get up from his chair. Why? 
Give me one reason why God would need to stand up from his chair. I know some of you make prayers like, arise, O God, and let your enemies be scattered. And in your imagination, you are thinking God will stand up from his throne to fight the devil on your behalf. The devil whom he didn't fight when he said, I will be like God. I will ascend and take my throne and be like the most high. God did not get up from his throne to fight the enemy. It was Michael, the, the archangel, and his angels that went to fight Satan, today you expect God to get up from his throne, to do things for you, then you don't understand the strength of God. God is strong. I like a scripture in the book of Chronicles, First Chronicles, that describes David and his armies. And the Bible in that particular verse says, and men came day by day to help David until his host grew and became like the host of God. One time, David was distressed. There was a battle going on, but he wanted water. He was thirsty. And amongst his mighty men, there were men that broke into the camp of the enemy simply so that they can get him a glass of water. So, David was thirsty, and David had water. Of course, he didn't drink it. But David was thirsty and David had water, but he didn't stand up from where he was seated. Are you understanding? The Bible shows us pictures of the kings of Israel trying to mirror what the kingdom of God is like. You see, you can even see when Joshua begins to fight in the book of Joshua, how that he sees the captain of the armies of the Lord from heaven because Joshua was the captain of the armies of the Lord on earth. Do you understand the concept of the generations of the heavens and the earth? There is a mirroring. God is strong. God does not need to get up from his throne to do anything. God does not have to have seen with his eyes in order to see. He does not need to have heard with his ears in order to hear. God does not need to appear to you to have appeared to you. You do not need to have eaten with God to have eaten with God. Imagine Gabriel saying, I stand before the presence of God. Yet the Bible tells us that angels saw God when Jesus came to earth. You need to understand the extents of God's strength. That there is nothing God can't do without getting up from his throne. Nothing. There's nothing God can't do without getting up from his throne because he has done the work. And now even the power for creativity, he has passed on to men. Oh, God is strong. God is strong. To understand this side of God's personality, that God is strong, that God is resourceful, that God would rather create an army to be able to achieve tasks than get up from his throne and do it. Because what would all his strength be for? His creative abilities, what would it all be for? What would, how would God say he has put his word to work? if he would not create worlds by which you achieve everything he wants to achieve. How about you? Are you a resource to God? Can God by your eyes see? Can God by your ears hear? The Bible says, after Samuel liaised with the children of Israel over the king they wanted, he went and rehearsed the words back in God's ears. What? God needed someone to explain what the people said. <laughs> I'm going to read to you, I'm going to show you rather in, in next week's episode, God putting his strength to work. We're going to look through the scriptures and see where God actually put his strength to work, where we can see the resourcefulness of God. So when you talk about God being strong. You need to understand what that means. Or show yourself strong. 
What exactly do you mean? Are you being a resource for God? Can God rely on you saying, ah, I don't need to get up from my throne to achieve that because there's, there's him, there's her. They can achieve it on my behalf. I know you're blessed. I know you've learned something today. Please share, like, leave it in the comments what you have learned, what you would like uh, me to touch on, clarify on. But I'm blessed to have been here with you sharing this, this word, the strength of God, the personality of God. God is strong. So next week we are continuing with we're continuing with the strength of God in our part three of the personality of God series. God is strong. We're going to now look at God actually putting his strength to work and what this means, God being strong. I'm so glad to have been here. Thank you so much. Fridays are every, Fridays of a Bible Talks, uh, every Friday, 20 hours Central African time. You can subscribe and watch out for Bible Talks every Friday. Thank you so much and see you in the next one. Hey, like what you see? I know you do. Hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell. Ciao.